So how many are ready for the word today? I'm going to dig into this together. Why don't we stand and we'll just pray and we'll dig right into it. Father, I thank you, God, this morning for this time together that we're able to study your word and see truth and allow it to change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. Well, you know, we started, um, four weeks ago, we started a series uh, on Ephesians. And it, it, it's been tough because there's so much meat in there, it's hard to, to kind of focus on certain elements of the scripture there. But um, we're doing the best we can here. So I wanted to, first of all, the first week we, um, we focused on being rooted in love, okay? Now that's uh, found in Ephesians 1, 4. I'm just going to give a really quick recap and then we'll dig into uh, what we're going to do today. Uh, love needs to be the foundation of all we do. And we see that in Paul's writings, even through other books, but especially in Ephesians, is that love is foundational for everything we do in Christ. We have to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. And if we get out of that posture of being rooted and flowing in love, we get into works, right? We get into, like, behavior modification and doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. And we don't want to be that. How many, how many hear what I say? We, we want to be rooted in love. Everything we do, we do out of our relationship for God. Okay, our relationship, sorry, with God. So love needs to be the foundation. We need to understand that our salvation was birthed from love. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so our salvation was birthed from love, so it needs to be maintained by love. And so many times, if we're not careful, we can just move away from being rooted in dry and just drawing the love of God from us to do what God's called us to do. And we want to we not do that, okay? We also talked about um, how Paul recognized, he, Paul recognized that the church of Ephesus was, had faith in Jesus Christ, number one, and then number two, that they had love for all the saints. So when you have these two things working together, if you have faith in God and love for the saints, there's deeper realms of revelation that God will open you up to, okay? He allows us to see deeper, and that's why Paul said, the moment I realize that you have faith and love working together, I continually, day and night, I'm praying for these things, number one, that God, you'd give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, number one. Number two, uh, that the spiritual eyes of their understanding would be enlightened so that they might know the hope of his calling. Number three, that they would know the exceeding greatness of his power that works in them. Now, this is a church that is faithful. They love God. They're, they're, they're doing well. And Paul says, you need to know there's more. He said, you need to understand that there's, there's a power that's working in you that is greater than anything you have understand up till now. And God wants to open your eyes to that. Okay? And because now you're rooted in love, you, you can handle this. Okay? And this is what he's giving. The second week, we spoke of where we're seated. Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8 talks about how God raised us up together and made us sit down on a throne in Christ in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power, and we talked about that. So how many, we can't go over all those lessons again, but how many know that Christ is seated in a place of authority and we're seated with him? So our prayers have power. We're able to move things and shift things in the earth. Why? Because, because of the authority that we have in Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to take what is mine, and he's going to declare it to you. And everything that the Father has belongs to Jesus. Everything that we need from God comes through the Holy Spirit. So we have an authority with God. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we talked about. All right? You might say, I don't feel like I have authority. I don't feel like I have spiritual stature yet. I just got saved two weeks ago. Let me tell you a story. I was about 19, and I was coming, I think I was coming back from Canada's Wonderland, had some friends in the car with me, and it was a newer, to me, a newer car, it was a Z24 sport, sports car, it was my, you know, it was my car, my dream car at the time. I'm coming back from, I'm on the highway, and I'm driving down the highway, and I could see there's this big overpass, it has a slight, a slight bend, and it turns, and it goes up and over, and my friend says to me, uh, how fast will this car go? 
I said, I don't know. I never, like, where does it top out? I said, I have no idea. And I said, maybe I should try. So there's not a lot of cars. And, you know, I don't see any police officers. So all of a sudden, I start revving out the gears. And I'm doing about a 180, 190. Like, this is bad. Don't anybody do this. This is bad. Because there's no one around, I figure it's safe, right? So, yes, I come over the top of this slight hill. And as I'm coming over, there's a cop sitting there with a radar gun. I'm doing 180. <laughs> I went by that cop so fast. I looked in my rearview mirror and I could see the cop's car disappearing. And, and I realized my friends are like, you can get off on this next exit. Like right here, zoom, you'll be gone, right? But then I remember I used to watch Cops. I remember that show. And I remember this cat and mouse chase and, and, and all that. I said, I'm not doing that. That's a bad idea. So I'm driving. And so all of a sudden I said, okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm just, my heart is pacing. Like how many know I wasn't doing 20 over? So I pull over, and all of a sudden, uh, this car comes in behind me, and out gets this police officer. It's a female. She's young. She must be four foot two. She's the smallest little police officer I saw. I'll tell you something. It could have been Arnold Schwarzenegger. It doesn't matter if it was a small person or a big person, a male or a female. There was an authority that I was terrified because the law, the full law was behind her. And I opened that window and I began to apologize. I'm sorry, ma'am. You know, I got this job. And if you take my license, I can't go to work. And I said, you know what? My friend just told me, you know, just how fast can the car go? I didn't see you there. You know, and I was trying to butter her up. So uh, she, I, I complimented her a few times and her hair and everything. Because that sometimes works with my wife. It didn't work with her. <laughs> and uh, so all of a sudden, she's, uh, she's giving me this ticket. And she could have given me, like, 60 over, okay, and I would have lost my license, but she was gracious, gave me 20 or 30 over, something like that. Told me, don't ever do that again. I'm like, yes, ma'am, and I, I don't think I ever did. I might have, but I don't, I'm not sure. No, I didn't, I didn't. But, but you see, she carried the full weight of the law, and so it doesn't matter if you're a new Christian. You just need to see it in the word that God has given you. He's placed you in a place of authority, and it doesn't matter how you feel God made you sit in that place, and he's given you authority, so you can pray, and in knowing that, your prayers will be answered, knowing that God has placed the full kingdom of God behind you. And the kingdom of darkness trembles, like I trembled, because you have full authority. There was another time, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. Um, <clears throat> And this lady, this friend of mine, she worked at the dry cleaners. Now, this is before I was a Christian guy, so don't go try this stuff, okay? And I said to her, I said, um, you know, can you get me a police? So she, she took a police, a police officer's uniform with the badges and everything on it, like on the arm and everything, and she gave it to me. And I had so much fun wearing that. Because everywhere I went, people would be like, you know, I would, you know, walk down the street and go by a bar, and people would be like, oh, you know, they thought I was a cop. It was so cool. It was because I had this badge on, right? And in the realm of the spirit, the enemy sees the blood of Jesus in your life and the authority that you carry. Amen? So God wants you to recognize that. And the third week, we talked about walking in unity. So we understand where we're seated. We're seated in a place of authority. Say that. I'm seated in a place of authority. Once you realize where you're seated, you, na you need to now understand how God wants you to walk. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, we talked about walking in unity. God wants us to walk in unity. We talked about walking in the new nature, not in the way we used to walk. When we talk about walking, it's the way you live your life. We walk differently. Why? Because we're new creatures in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, right? And so we also talked about not grieving the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 32, and I'm just going to read through a few of them. We're not to send, we're, sorry, we're not to sin when we're angry. How many know you can be angry, but sin not? In other words, learn how to walk away and cool off before you blow up, okay? How many know we've all done that? We're just kind of like, if I would have taken some time to think it through, I probably would have responded differently, okay? So the thing is, you will get angry. It's a natural emotion, but don't sin when you get angry. This is one of the things we're not to do. Don't give place to the devil, don't put yourself in a position where you'll be tempted. The next thing we talked about is don't steal anymore. Don't use um, inappropriate language anymore. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by testing him. Testing his grace. 
Oh, God will forgive me. I'll just do this. You know, I, and you just test God all the time. Put away from you all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, uh, and evil speaking. And lastly, be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another. All right. Does anyone find it hot in here? Okay. So am I either having a hot flash? Does that happen to men in their 40s? I don't know. Is that just women? <laughs> Owen, can you put the air conditioner on or something? So we're, we're to walk in unity, right? God wants us to walk in unity. And, and I think this is where the enemy trips us up because, you know, as churches, we, we're all a little bit different. We have a different um, flow of where, where we're going with God. And um, I want to go back and park on unity for a few minutes. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, Paul is writing a letter. Can we bring that scripture up, Candy? I don't know if I put it in there. Okay, Paul is writing, he says, um, and I want you to know this, he says, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, he was actually a prisoner in Rome, he was probably under lock and key, in fact, he was probably staring at a guard in Roman armor when he wrote about the armor of God, because he was, he was drawing an analogy when he did that, but he's, in, he's a prisoner in Rome, and he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, which you were called. You know, you can be in a place where you, you feel like you're in prison and still be flowing out of grace. This is an amazing man. He's encouraging them in that place. And it says here, okay, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bear with one another in love. See the word in love again? I love that. Be gentle, long-suffering, bearing with, with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith. All right? To keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, what lowliness means, lowliness means to be humble-minded, have a humble attitude of unselfish concern for the welfare of others. It's a total absence of arrogance, conceit, in hardiness, abstaining from self only then can members of the Christian community maintain unity and harmony. Gentleness means a disposition that is even-tempered and tranquil, balanced in spirit. Okay? And the word for long-suffering describes a person who has the power to exercise revenge, but instead exercises restraint. Okay? The word endeavoring means to make every effort to give diligence, to be zealous, and to strain every nerve in, 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 to further the cause. Okay? And I wanted to park here for a moment because the reality is the church, the universal church, I'm talking, not just talking about the local church, but the universal church, we need to learn to get together. Amen. We need to stand together on the truths that unite us or we're going to fall apart on the beliefs that divide us. What do we believe? We believe what the scripture says, that we're to walk in unity. We believe that we are, um, we believe in one body, one Lord, one baptism, one Father, right, right here, who is in all and above all and through all and in you all. And so the church needs to learn to stand together on the things that we unite on. Amen? And many times we don't. We could be a force to be reckoned with if we'd learn to do that. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. The other way we're supposed to walk is we're supposed to walk in the light. We're to walk in the light. And here, here it is in verse, uh, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I love this verse because he's talking about um, walking in. He does, okay, so for you were once darkness. It doesn't say for you were once in darkness. It says for you were once darkness. There's a difference. The Bible says that God took us out of the kingdom of darkness and he, he took us and he planted us into the kingdom of his dear son. We were taken out of the kingdom of darkness and we were put into a new kingdom. And so it, we're not, no longer part of darkness. We're part of the, the kingdom of light. Amen? Amen? In Ephesians chapter 5, 
verse 9, it tells us what that means. Because we say, well, what does it mean to, to walk in light? Or what does it mean to be light versus darkness, okay? It says here, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So I, I look at it this way, guys. The, saying, I walk in the light, means you're walking in the fruit of the Spirit. It's the same thing. So every time you see the Bible talk about walking in light or living in the light and not being in the darkness, it's talking about living in the fruit of the Spirit. And so God wants us to live in the fruit of the Spirit. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and just go over that. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, okay, um, But the the fruit of the Spirit, I'm going to look up here, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. That's what the Bible says. Okay? And so to walk in the light means that you're walking in the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed their passions and desires of the sinful nature to the cross, and they've crucified them there. Since we are living living by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So we're, we're to walk in the Spirit, and we're to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and kindness. That's the fruit that comes out of being planted and rooted in love. There's a tenderness. There's a gentleness. There's, there's all this stuff that begins to naturally uh, produce fruit. A tree doesn't sit there and go, and then pop, an apple comes out. No, there's no, there's no, there's no pressure there. There's no pressure to perform. Christians are so busy trying to, to, to produce fruit. You don't produce fruit by trying harder. You produce fruit by being rooted in love. Being, being grounded in God, the fruit will naturally begin to come out of your life. The fruit will naturally begin to produce in your life. Why? Because you're rooted and grounded in love with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And so there's a new kind of person walking on the earth. The Bible says that we're new creatures in Christ. Before Jesus rose from the dead, there was animals and there was, uh, there was human spirits. But now there's a new kind of creature. It's, it's a person who's been born of the Spirit. You have a human spirit with the Holy Spirit living with you. That's a new kind of creature. That's who we are. And the goal of every follower of Jesus is to walk in both the power and the character Of the kingdom, God made his power and authority available to create a different kind of lifestyle in the believer, one that attracts others by light instead of darkness. I want want you guys to get this. I'm going to give you an example. I'll use my own life, for example. Okay? One of the things that really changed in me was the music I listened to. Okay? I used to listen to heavy metal, a lot of heavy metal, and stuff before I was saved. Now I still like heavy metal if it's if it's Christian if it's coming from a Christian spirit. But the problem was um, after I gave my heart to Christ, as I was listening to some of the old bands I used to listen to, it felt like darkness to me. Okay, it felt like you know when I listen to worship UCB or I listen to worship CDs or I listen to um, Christian music. It's, it's like I feel like I can connect. It's like I feel like it, it feels like it's, it's like goodness and kindness and peace. And, and, and even though the person singing the music might not be perfect, they're still pilgrims in progress, but they have something in them. It's called the light of Christ. And I can connect and I can relate to that. But now when I listen to not all secular music, because I'm not here to say secular is sinful and Christian music is righteous. I'm here to say that it's not an issue of this is, wrong, this is sinful and this is right. It's an issue of this is darkness and this is light. And I can't, so naturally I couldn't listen to the music anymore because it would bring me down. It would make me feel dirty. Amen? So I'm full of light, and so when I, when I hear someone singing, I can relate to that because it's connecting with my spirit, because my spirit is light. I'm no longer darkness, I'm now light. So I can relate to light. So now I listen to some of this music, 
and it makes me feel dark. It reminds me of who I used to be. Anyone hear what I'm saying? And it doesn't produce righteousness, it produces... So it's not an issue of this is wrong and this is right. It's an issue of this is darkness and this is light. And so the light of God's presence is in me. So now it's no longer that I, I don't have to strive. It's not that I can't do that because it's sinful. I can't do that because the Bible says it's wrong. It's I don't want to do that because it's darkness and I'm in the kingdom of light. Does anyone hear what I'm saying this morning? Now, I'm using music as an example. And I'm not saying that there's, there's some secular music that I'll listen to because it doesn't, it's not full of darkness. But I'm saying, for the most part, do you get the picture I'm saying? I can't watch some of the movies I used to watch because I feel it's dark. And when it hits my spirit, my spirit feels like, Ooh, that's, I, don't, I don't want that in my life. So that, na- that desire and that need to be controlled by sin is no longer there because I have light in my heart. Now I want to do what's right because I'm full of light instead of darkness. So that's just a little example. Another example is, um, you know, I used to be able to gossip like the best of them. And I'd be at work, right? And somebody would start talking about the boss or another employee. I mean, I'd get right in there and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it kind of feels good because, you know, we're imperfect, so it feels good to talk about other other people's flaws, right? It makes us feel better about ourselves. But now that as a Christian now, I got saved, I'm going and I'm sitting with the same group of guys. And it's awkward because they'd be like saying all these nasty things behind somebody's back. And I'd be, I'd be like, yeah, but let's think about the positive here. You know, so-and-so also does good in this area. And it's kind of like, they'd look at me like, you're weird, man. And they began to persecute me because the light in me was offending the darkness in them. And that's the issue. See, as, as children, children of light, we're going to offend people who have darkness in them. Right? Can I, can I talk to you for a second? And, and here, here's what... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. But this is the condemnation, that light has come into the darkness, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, and they don't want their deeds to be exposed, so they reject the light. And so we have churches now that want to um, say, well, listen, our church service is like a floodlight, and it's freaking out people who don't know God, so let's turn it down and put a nightlight on. We won't preach the word too strong. We won't talk. We'll just touch on these certain things. And, you know, we won't, we won't shout and lift our hands and, and worship God because we, it's too bright for people. <laughs> you hear me? So, so what I'm saying is that Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? The culture of heaven is grace, joy, peace, love, patience, gentleness. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's flowing in your life. It's offending people around you. Don't turn the light down. Let the light shine before men. And if you do, you're going to be persecuted. Not because you're preaching. I, I, I don't know if you guys have figured this out, but I find like, okay, I won't preach as much. I won't talk about Jesus. And they still don't like me. Why? Because it's the light that we carry. That's right. Some of you can relate to what I'm saying. Yes, ma'am. And so, so there's light. And so there's certain movies I don't listen to anymore or watch. And certain music, I can't, certain people I just can't hang out with anymore because it's, it's negative. It's like dark, dark, dark. And I just want to be around the light. And you might say, Pastor... I'm Christian, and I can watch whatever and listen to whatever, and it doesn't bother me. Well, let's see what Jesus says about that. Go to Luke chapter 11, verse 35. Luke 11, verse 35. We'll bring it up. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Let that sink in. If you are filled with light with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. Right? And so I literally was in Bible school and I had Christians saying, well, why don't you want to go see that movie? I'm like, because it's R-rated. 
but it doesn't bother me. Well, I would say make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Because it bothers me. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean, see, it doesn't mean we're, we're not going to fall into sin or be tempted and make mistakes. But for the most part, we're not attracted by darkness anymore because we have a new nature. We've been saved. We've been sanctified. The light of God's presence is in us. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay? And uh, back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says here, You who are spiritual, restore such a one, and here's the thing, in a spirit of gentleness. Okay, that's the next verse. Considering yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3 says, For anyone who thinks himself to be something, he is nothing. All right? And then he says, Every man needs to examine his own work, and then he will rejoice in himself alone and not under another person, for each person will carry their own load. That's what it says. And so, the fruit of the Spirit has to be grown in your life. It has to be grown. It's not just going to happen overnight. It's, uh, you know, you, you have to remain rooted and grounded in love. Paul says, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. So just root yourself in God. And if you feel like you don't have conviction in certain areas, I'm, this is not a message of condemnation. Start praying. Start spending time with God. Start worshiping God. And you watch. Your appetites will begin to change because the light of God will begin to flow again in your heart. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Holy Spirit and not after the flesh. And what I've noticed is that when I start, as a pastor even, when I stop walking after the Spirit and start walking after the flesh, watch too many movies, you know, spend too much time on the Internet, spend too much time on other things rather than in the Bible and prayer, what happens is I begin to have appetites for the things of the past. But when I spend time with God, rooted in Him, my appetites are for the things of God. That's right. Amen? That's why we have to guard our heart. That's why we need to pray always. We have to pray. We have to be in that place. Amen? So it's amazing because no longer is it about right and wrong. It's, 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 it's about darkness and light. Amen. And it's a whole different paradigm of thinking, a, tr a different way of thinking about how we, um, we're to, to live. The other thing we need to do is we need to walk in wisdom. So we have to walk in the light. Say, walk in the light. Then we need to walk in wisdom. How many want to walk in wisdom? Okay. So let's go to that uh, verse in Ephesians chapter 5. And it is verse 15. It says, See that you do not walk circumspectly, not as fools. Sorry. See that you walk circumspectly, not, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because... The days are evil. You know, we need, we need to watch uh, where we're walking. So you can come to my backyard in Caring Place. You don't have to watch where you're walking. You can do this. You can just walk around. No worries at all. Now, if you go to my childhood home, we had dogs. And back in those days, 30 years ago, we didn't follow dogs around with a little plastic bag picking up the doo-doo. Do you not understand what I'm saying? We had this issue where you look for the green patches in the yard. You know, you could see, well, there's a green patch. There's got to be some poo there. There's a green patch there. So you would just kind of know where to step. And once in a while, you'd get it anyway. You'd be like, oh, man, you know. And so you always have to watch. You don't want to step in crap. you got to watch where you're walking. This is what Paul is saying. Watch where you're walking. Look where you're taking your steps. I had a friend, actually, who got saved. He was a, he was a drug dealer. He was a, had a potty mouth. Like, he swore terribly. And uh, one day, he's now a Christian. And he goes, ah, oh, shapoopies. And that, it was just hilarious. So for, we would walk around going, shapoopies. You know, that was like the new word to kind of, anyway, you guys don't get it. <laughs> but you got to watch where you're stepping, right? And you got to watch who you're hanging out with and what you're, what you're listening to and what you're watching. Watch where you're stepping. Watch where you're going, right? Don't be a fool. Be very careful where you go. Redeeming the time because... The days are evil, knowing what the will of the Lord is. How many know the Holy Spirit is talking to us constantly? 
You know, I was living in Kingston, and I was running a window and door company. And there was a neighbor next door, and I, didn't re- I knew his mother-in-law. She lived there, and he was living there as well. And God began to speak to me. He says, you need to take him out for a coffee and talk to him. And I was like, I'm busy. Did anyone ever argue with God, or is it just me? <laughs> yes, Lord, I'll do it. But I, I kept putting it off. And I actually went and talked to him. Hey, would you like to get together for a coffee sometime? He said, yeah, I'd really like to talk to you. And, okay, great. We'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. And then I got busy, and, and God kept putting this urgency on me to talk to the guy. And, and I kept putting it off. I kept putting it off. I kept putting it off. Because I was busy. And um, put it off. One day I came home from work, and his mother-in-law was on the porch crying. I came in. I said, what's, what's going on? She goes, my son-in-law hung himself in a barn, committed suicide. And she looked at me, and she goes, he wasn't baptized. He didn't know God. And, you know, I had to walk through that. I had to walk through that. I had to deal with my own heart. So now if I feel the Lord saying, talk to somebody, I'm like, yes, sir. If there's, a, if there's fear, and sometimes there is because, you know, you, you never know how people respond. You have to learn to be jumping hurdles in the spirit. If there's a hurdle of fear, just jump over it. And once you jump over, it's not there anymore. And you just go in for the kill and share the gospel. Amen. And so that crushed me inside because God had spoken to me about that. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, you know, Watch where you walk. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay? Uh, Verse 17. Therefore, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. I'm going to bring that up. It says that wine is a, a, mar, a strong drink, is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. All right? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31 uh, to 35. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations. You will uh, say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea clinging to the swaying mask, and you will say, they hit me, but I didn't feel it. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? And um, we should not be dependent on anything but God. If you're the type of person, you come home from work, and you have to have a glass of wine. It just, I just need it to relax. You're dependent on something other than God. The Holy Spirit needs to be your peace, Right? You can't be dependent on anything but God. Ephesians 5, verse 18 says, But be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. There is an intoxication that we should go after, and that's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is the new wine, and we, should need, we need to be able to press into that, okay? And press into the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 to 16, gets into um, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, or the gifts of Jesus, which is the fivefold ministry, which we're going to touch on probably next week. Um, but anyway, God is good. Amen? Amen? So I don't want to go any further with this today, and so why don't we stand for a second? And, and you know, when we're talking about um, darkness and light, instead of talking about what's wrong and what's right, it's a better way of looking at life. Amen? I'm not talking about legalism. You know, how many grew up in churches where you couldn't, it was a sin to go to a movie? It was a sin to play cards. It's, a, it's you know, we, growing up, alcohol was the unpardonable sin when I was a kid. It was like, you can't touch it. It's demonic, you know. And you grow up with that kind of, that kind of um, legalistic thing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about having a conscience of your own based on what is right and what is wrong, based on your conviction level. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? 
What is light? What is darkness? And so we need to grow in that. We need to develop that in our own lives. Amen? Father, I thank you for this word today, Lord, that we can take something away from it, Father, that we are growing in you, Lord, that we're going to learn to walk in the light in greater dimensions, Father, and that we put off the old man and put on the new man. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.